Welcome everyone. My name is Blake and I will be your moderator this evening. Tonight we're joined by Dr. Thomas for a first-hand account of her experience using Densply Slurona's Prime Print 3D printer. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box label to have a question. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this pre presentation live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Densply Serona. Welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass it over to you now. All right, awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Blake, and welcome everyone. So happy to have you here. And uh, I have to say that I was inspired by this slide to kind of bring us into the next dimension of dentistry, printing, right? This is the Bifrost for those of you who are familiar with this. This is from Marvel's Thor. And uh, the Bifrost is sort of the gateway into different dimensions. And, uh, and I have to say that uh, printing to me is that dimension. It's moving into a direction of, uh, of pioneering new things for, um, for dentistry and what kind of services we're actually providing for patients. So I'm so super excited tonight to actually share our experiences. Um, I say our because I actually practice with my husband in um, Poway, California. It's like North County, San Diego. And he is a German trained dentist. I met him when I was serving in the United States Air Force in Germany. And so we have now been practicing together for almost 20 years in San Diego. And I have to say that part of our motivation for collaborating with Densply Serona, which at the time in 2003 was actually just Serona, is, you know, in the military, we always had our labs right readily available to us. And so anytime that we had an issue with a, a crown or a prosthesis, we could just go right over to the lab and talk to them and find out exactly what we needed to do, to, what kind of adjustments we needed to make to, um, to get things to go for our patients. So we were sort of spoiled in that way. And so when we came into the civilian sector and we were working with labs and you would get a crown and the crown didn't you know, fit correctly or the impressions had issues or you know, what it, what, whatever it was, it was extremely frustrating. And that wasn't the level of care that we were looking to provide for our patients. We wanted to do something different. So when we had sought out the, the CEREC 3 at that time, it was a re the red cam. We thought this is gonna be really cool. One injection, no temporaries for our patients, really easy for, for our patient care. And, and patients love that aspect of our care. So now we're able to add a new level and that's the printing level. And I'll explain to you why. So the concept of printing. So here we were um, in these past uh, 15 years or so, we've been you know, making crowns for our patients. And it was exciting when our scanners actually went across the arch and we could know that our cross arch imaging was super accurate. The only missing piece we had to this cross arch scanning was the actual printing. If we needed to print something and make Essex or, or make a retainer, make a, a, a splint of, of some sort, you know? So the printing piece was the, the piece that was missing. So everyone's been working really diligently, I think over the past five, 10 years and, and trying to get this, this printing piece mastered. And I really feel that the prime print has brought us to that mastery level. It's really, really fun to work with. And I'm gonna just spend a couple of minutes talking about our journey with printing. So how did we get interested in printing? Well, this is really super simple. I mean, impressions are gooey, they're icky, they're not fun, they're not fun for your team, they're not fun for your patient. And how disappointing is it when, you know, you've got everything under control and then you have all of a sudden a little bleeder that disrupts your impression and you gotta do it over again. So this was something that we really, really disliked with our clinical workflow when it came time for um, you know, getting impressions. So we're thinking here we are making crowns with a scanner. Why can't we actually do a scan and make a model? This would make such a huge difference for us. So now we are there today and the process is so much easier and unstressful for our patients. 
Our patients are happy about this. They don't ever want to have another impression taken as long as they live. So we have a lot of people who come to us specifically for this technology and, um, and it makes our life really fun. It's fun for our team. We're able to delegate them and give them more things to do and um, makes, makes our job fun. So here's some of the past printers that I have allowed my, ex, my husband to, to dink around with. Um, I say dink around with because for me, if I can't turn it on and have it do what I want it to do, then I'm not gonna mess around with it. I don't want anything that's complicated. So for him, he wanted to play around with this and, and sort of develop workarounds for these dinner, different printers. So, you know, I would say that some of these, I think, got into our household around 2019. This isn't even something we took to our office. This is something that we were exploring together, uh, or more so maybe him, um, because it was messy, it was stinky, it was working on a level that I just didn't have time to explore or even try to understand. You actually had to work with a, uh, let me get this little thing here started. You worked with your model resin and with your model <laughs> resin, <laughs> you wanted to mix it well. So ironically enough, there was this rock tumbler that you could put the resin tube in and it would mix it up really well. You notice on the left side of the, <laughs> the opening there's actually a barbell so that would support the the top end of the the um uh bottle but it's messy you know you pour it into a vat and it's not contained it's smelly it's messy you don't want the stuff on your hands you always have to wear gloves you always have to wear a mask and you should definitely be wearing using uh, um, some kind of eye protection and then when you were done you had to actually strain it and put it back to where it belonged not fun, not something that we were looking forward to doing. So in 2021, we actually went with some printing technology that was leaps and bounds above those past printers that I was just sharing with you. And this was exciting. Um, the only problem is, is it still wasn't that plug and play, the turn on and here, this is how it works. It was leaps and bounds above where we had come from in printing. So it was exciting. You had uh, a pretty easy vat that you would have your bill plate. And then you had this middle area here, which is uh, your alcohol wash area. So you could wash everything without having to touch the bill plate, which again was really magnificent. But then after you're done with rinsing it, you would pick it off of the plate, which sometimes I kind of felt like helter skelter trying to get these things off of the bill, the, uh, build plate were really, really hard to separate. And then you could actually damage your, whatever you're printing, your model, your, your splint. And then you put it into a curing box here and then it would cure. A lot of times these things came out and they still were really sticky, but it was working most of the time. So here you can see on the left-hand picture, the vat that actually contains the resin. Now, before you actually start printing, you wanna swirl this around and make sure that you get any pieces or parts that may have been left over from the previous print out of that resin material, because that could disrupt your, your print. Uh, likewise, you wanna make sure that you've got it, you know, a good mixture, the resin has been sitting for a little while. But then sometimes, you'd get done printing two hours later and you get a misprint. So that's two hours you've been waiting for it and it's misprint. So this got to be a little bit frustrating and it was really time consuming, I have to say. You know, I was happy that that my husband would come home and actually work on, on doing these things and he showed me how to, to get um, printing models, designing splints, things of that nature but it took us pretty much all evening. So, you know, you're working all day and then you come home and you've got to try to figure out how you're going to get the stuff printed, right? So like now we're working way into our evening hours, less family time together. It just wasn't exactly easy enough for us. The other part that we didn't really like about this process is the fact that you know you have a universal washing sta station. So while you don't have to touch the build plate, you still 
are using different types of resins. So models have different resins from splints. Surgical guides have different resins from models and, uh, and splints. And when you're rinsing all of these uncured resins in the same reservoir, that kind of left us not so excited about putting that product into a patient's mouth. So that was something that was not very desirable. And then still having the, um, the, the tackiness, the um, inhibition layer on your resin model was also not very desirable. So doing this all at home, working after hours, still not quite as easy as we would like it. So when Dent Supply Serona released the prime print and we read our, our studies about it, we were super excited about it. And this is what we're here to talk about tonight, our first 60 days with that prime print. And while I was slightly reluctant to actually implement this, yes, it's very true. I was reluctant to implement this into our office. I have to say by and large, my personal opinion, it's one of the best products that Dent Supply Serona has ever made. It's very, very well thought out and I love it. It's, it's a great addition to our workflow and it allows me to do a lot of things that we're going to talk about tonight. So it's user-friendly. Turn it on. It's basically plug and play. It's exactly the style that I want it to be. It has to be simple. If it's easy for me, it's easy for my team. The second thing is, is I want a high resolution model. A lot of the models that we were printing in the past, they weren't so high resolution. And if I'm going to, to be looking at these models for, um, for occlusal analysis, uh, jaw joint evaluation, those kind of things, I really want to have the highest accuracy model. So prior to actually printing, we would do PVS impressions and then pour that up in stone. That's the high accuracy that I want to have, the high resolution that I want to have on my models. The other thing is, is well, what if I don't need that? What if I need just an alginate, an alginate level, level of accuracy? I want to be able to, to dial that down or dial it up, whatever I think the indication is, it has to be easy to do. I also want it to be as safe as possible for my team. I need my team to partake in this because I'm done with having my husband work in the evenings on printing everything we need to print. We should be able to do this during the day. So the right system is gonna be one that allows me to be efficient, that my team can manage, they can take care of everything and I have everything that I need and I don't have to worry about that backlog because the doctors weren't available to complete X, Y, and Z. So implementation, you're gonna need storage. There are some things that you're gonna need to have like your alcohol containers, I'll talk about those in a moment, but have storage, put it in a place where you can have storage. You don't have to worry about putting this into an area like a lunchroom, for instance, which is where we first had it, and our team was not excited about it whatsoever, but there's no odor with these, it's quiet, and Honestly, we had it in our lunchroom because we had a lack of space. We had to actually get rid of uh, a CBCT before we moved that into that area. And this has worked out um, beautifully for us uh, in the lunchroom and now in its new space, but you need to have storage. So what we did is we actually went to Ikea and Ikea has great cabinetry and countertops and different surface textures. So actually what I have depicted in this picture is the surface of these Ikea um, cabinets. So relatively inexpensive, it's the right amount of storage we needed. It fit our um, prime print units, perfect. So that's what we used here. So thank you, Ikea. These are the accessories that actually come with the prime print. We'll start on the upper left with the transport box. This is the box that actually contains the build plate. So depicted below is the build plate. We have resin cartridges and there is resin for your temporaries. There's resin for your splints, your surgical guides, your models for models that will be under some heat. So all these different type of resins and for every resin, you need to have two alcohol containers. And this is where the storage comes into play. So you see those alcohol containers, they're pitchers, the same size basically as the transport box. You need to have 
two alcohol containers for every resin. Then you're gonna have these material units that hold the actual resin cartridge. So the great thing about the prime print is that all of the resin is dispensed from this cartridge to the perfect amount that you'd need for your print. So you're not wasting any kind of resin. So it will dispense it out once it gets the order and it's very accurate, no waste. Then you're also going to have your in-lab. Your in-lab is where you're going to be using things for your model design, for your splints, for um, printing temporaries, printing dentures eventually. And this is where the in-lab software comes into play. And lastly, you're gonna use nitrogen. Now the nitrogen's role in the prime print is to take care of the inhibition layer so that you don't have that tackiness on your models. Your models actually come out of the post-processing unit. They are smell-free, they're toxicity-free. There's no tacky resin, uncured resin on them whatsoever. They come out magically ready to go, beautiful. The second thing you're gonna to wanna to do for implementation is you gotta get the training. Right, that Densefly Serona has great trainers and they put together all of the different workflows. So they try to make it as simple as possible for you. Your team, if they've already been using CEREC, this is gonna be um, a pretty easy implementation for them. And they're ready, they're off and running. They've been scanning for years. They're gonna get ready to, to now do their printing. So we'll do a full mouse scan and this is what your window will look like. So you have new icons over here. This is gonna be your model icon. This is gonna be your tray. So if you wanted to make a custom tray, you could do that. And then this here is gonna be your splint icon. So you'll work down your model, the type of model. So we can do solid models or we can do working models. Here, we're gonna do a solid model. There's two types of model material. One is a thermal, that's called prime print model T, and the other is prime print model. Currently, I am using prime print model for everything. So we do aligners in our office, we do Essex, and we are using that with our mini star, and we haven't had any issues with thermal damage to the models. So you'll do your full scan. In your model phase, you'll clean up your scan so that you don't have those little stragglers. And then the design phase, you're gonna go ahead and set the, the model height. You can carve out the model so that you're conservative with the amount of resin that's getting dispensed. Put a name, put a date, and then you're ready to send that off to be manufactured. Now that's gonna go off into the in-lab cam. So you can see here on the right side under the manufacturer tab, export to in-lab cam, and that's what we'll do. You can actually say start job, and then that will transition you automatically into your in-lab, oh, hold on a minute, into your in-lab software. So you can see here we have in lab model, sorry, in lab model, in lab splint, in lab CAD, in lab CAD. In lab CAD is where you actually can make restorations. The CAM is going to be like the central part where you're going to be printing everything. So when you have models, they'll go to the CAM. If you don't have CEREC where you're actually designing your models, in um, CEREC, then you would export your STL into the in-lab model. You can also export into in-lab splint, and I'm gonna demonstrate that for you in just a moment. Once you have everything set up on your build plate, your assistant, or actually my assistant do everything. They don't even design the models. They know where to put everything but I'm gonna just step back here for a minute because, no, okay. So she's gonna go ahead and load that transport box into the, prime, the printer. 
models that are of a low resolution take a little under an hour to make. So that gives you your time units there. On the right side is your actual transport box. This is after it comes out of the printer, or actually it's in the printer. We're getting ready to transfer it into the post-processing unit. But you can see that the models, the printed models are completely contained. They are protected from light. They protect your team from any smells or touching the resin. And in the back area there, you can actually see the prime print model. That's actually the cartridge. That is where the um, resin is dispensed from. And now in the post-processing unit, we have the transport box that got put onto the far right. And then these are the two alcohol containers. So a robotic arm will take that build plate once the door is closed, and it's going to uh, lift that build plate up, and it's gonna go into each one of these containers for the washing process. Now, I had a low um, resolution model there that is under 60 minutes, but under 90 minutes, you can have these high resolution models and look how beautiful these are. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never been able to capture these kind of hooks that you use for rubber bands ever in an Elginet or mind you, a, a PVS impression. Most of the time that PVS would lock there and then it would tear. It would be almost a nightmare to get that out of a patient's mouth. But look at how beautiful the detail is on these models. It's, it's amazing. Oh yeah, I had to put those arrows in just in case you couldn't see those hooks. So here's a high resolution model on the left side. Looks just like the models that I've been desiring to see. Um, with my, with you know, the stone models that I used to have uh, fabricated from PVS impressions. I'm really happy I can see detail with those. I can see where that's what I really, really want when I'm evaluating a patient's dentition and planning to do some restorative work. On the right hand side, these kind of models. Okay, so now you can really see the difference in the resolution. So these were pretty fast um, processing under 60 minutes. They're um, perfect for. Um, maybe diagnostic models, if you, you just want to get a general idea of what's happening with the patient's occlusion. They're perfect for bleaching trays. You can make bleaching trays with these type of models. We do tend to use our high resolution models for, um, for our, um, excuse me, our Invisalign um, aligners, um, also for our retainers. So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the working model. This has been fantastic. As a dentist who is a CEREC dentist and um, doing my own aesthetic cases or doing my posterior cases, this has been an absolute game changer for me. This is how the working model works. So there's two different types of dyes you can actually uh, make or you can, whatever you call them, stumps. This one fastens right in there. It is so easy to do, and you can really appreciate the detail. So let's just take a moment to review the workflow a little bit. So in this particular case, I'm doing six anterior veneers. So I've got everything laid out. You can see it in the case details. I'm gonna be doing Emacs, and I wanna be able to have the ability to do all my lab work on a model. So we used to send this out to the lab. I don't need to do that anymore. I can capture this right here doing working model. Here, this is saying, do you wanna use prime print model T printing? No, I'm just gonna use prime print model material. So I'll make that change right here. And then I'm ready to go, except for I need to click on which arch I'm gonna be doing. So it's gonna be the upper arch. It can print the lower arch for you as well, but here we're just gonna focus on the upper. So we'll add that. And now you see that added to your case details. So what I like to do in these cases is I'll go ahead and get my model fabricating while I design my restorations. By the time my model is completed, I'll have my restorations all milled out. So here I've outlined my, my margins. I have to say, I probably could have cleaned up my model a little bit better. I'm gonna take care of that in the model phase, so I'm not too worried about that. 
and here's what it looks like in the um, in lab in the in lab cam software actually part of me in lab model software once I'm done with my design here, this will get exported into the in-lab cam, and that is where I will print it from. So you can see on the upper right, create stumps. I have a couple of different options for the root form for those. Right now I'm finalizing things because I like what I see. I'll, however, I don't really wanna have a solid model, so I'm actually gonna tell the computer to carve it out or tell the software to carve it out so that I don't waste unnecessary resin. So I think that's a real cost-effective model that's been really um, very accurate for us. We've done several prints and I haven't had to do anything yet as far as replenish the cartridges. So that's all really cool. And here I can enter my text and the date, whatever I need to have in there for the models. So now I'm in the in-lab cam. This is where I'm gonna print from. So all of my data is over here in this side. I had to block out patient's name for privacy, but you get the basic idea. We're gonna check all of these. And here I have the option uh, to arrange or produce. At the very top, you see the arrange or produce. And I basically have already arranged these things. So I'm gonna go right to produce. So when I go to the bottom, I'm figuring out what material and whatnot I'm gonna use here, which is gonna be the prime print model. But down at the bottom, there's that fast forward all the way. And I'm gonna go there first. Let's see what the software will give me in terms of the support position, my drainage holes. Do I need to make adjustments? Most of the time I have to say no. All right. So here I am, it's got it all designed onto my, um, my build plate. And I wanna just make sure that it's not on any of the vital structures that could maybe inhibit the flow of my um, stumps going into the model, make sure that uh, it doesn't interfere with any of my margins. So there is one little support that I'm not that fond of I'm gonna take that guy off. So that will give me the opportunity just to demonstrate for you all fine people how to do that. So we're gonna go back to a range and in tools, you can add, move or delete these support systems. So all you need to do is just click right on that support and click delete and it's gone, right? So let's just show you one more time how to do that. Not that we necessarily need to delete these particular areas, but uh, just to demonstrate exactly how easy that is, that's how that works. And here's how that comes out. Now for those, oh, one second. Okay. So for those of you who have actually separated these things from build plates, this is actual time, how easy it is to get it off. So I'm just gonna mute this. Have to crop your video. There we go. And okay, get ready, brace yourself. Here we go. We're gonna push on that and flick, 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 and big one, and it's done, right? So that is huge. That was huge for me. May not be huge for you, but for me, that was amazing because I used to have to really pry to uh, separate the actual model from the build plate. In fact, I think that the, the more you pry, the more damage you would get to the build plate. So this was really great. And here's what that working model looks like. It has a really accurate fit, it's smooth, and you can see how those dies fit right into place. And there was no adjustments needed for these um, for these dies or stumps, whatever you want to call it. Stumpfa is what they call it in Deutsch. And you know, this is a German product we're working with here. So that's what they're using. So here are my milled restorations. You can appreciate how they fit on the dies. This one here actually had a fracture on the uh, restoration. So we're gonna remill that one right there. 
So that's how working models go. And huge, huge for us. I don't have to wait for the lab to make me those anymore. I can get going on that right away. So it is definitely, um, it is definitely improved. Um, it, I would say made my workflow so much more efficient and we don't have that additional cost. So we like that. Let's take a moment to review surgical guide. So here we are, we have a tooth that's missing and patients ready to move forward with their implant restoration. So we're gonna take our software system, we're gonna do a CBCT, do a nice scan with our prime scan and plan for the future restoration of where that implant crown will go. Next, we're gonna export that file, that plan of that restoration in this format, a SIXD format put it in a common location so that you can grab it into your implant planning software. So here we're using CCAD. And in a moment, we're going to import that file that I scanned. So we'll bring that on in here. And for those of you who, you know, this is your, your implant guides that we're working on here. Now, in the past, what we used to do is mill these, but we would always run into trouble when you had more than one implant. What if you were placing two or three implants? These are our scans and CBCTs that we would send off and we would have somebody else design for us or, you know, make the surgical guide uh, for us but now we can actually have them design it and send us the STL and we print it. And that has definitely reduced our expenses. So again, looking where, where are areas that we can be more time efficient, where are areas where we're gonna be actually saving money. So right now what we're doing is we're actually stitching the CBCT and our scan together by identifying common landmarks. So that's all we need to do. And then we are gonna press next and it will show us where it's actually stitched things together. And that will be in our CBCT. So the line that you see there is actually the scan. And as you run through your CBCT here, you wanna make sure that the silhouette of the tooth is followed and that makes you feel more confident that your scan and your CBCT have actually stitched accurately together. And now you can go ahead and do your planning. Where is the good bone? What uh, size implant do you wanna use? How deep should it go? Do all of those things so that you can make your, your implant placement as easy and flawless as possible. So here's what that looks like. We've identified the vital structures. You can see the scan in here. Now we're ready to design our guide. We'll export this back into our CEREC. And now we'll go through the design phase. You wanna have a couple of windows there so you can ensure that it's seated completely. Once we're done finalizing, we're gonna go ahead and manufacture. So this is how we used to do it, where we would use a big block and these blocks were around $50, $60. And then we would go ahead and we'd mill it. It was messy and required that your milling unit get super cleaned out. So we're super glad that we don't do that anymore. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to export this into our in-lab. This is ready to be printed. So we'll go ahead and click on this and here you can see that it is in place. We're going to check mark that. Can change the job name to be specific for the patient so there's no confusion. <clears throat> and there you have it on your build plate. And that looks just about right. That's where you want it. So when that's done printing, all you'll have to do is remove the supports. Now, I didn't select a material here when I made this video, but we'll go in and we'll do that. But that's the basic idea here. Now we're going to start production. 
And here's how it looks when it comes out. Exactly like it. Now, what we have here is a little holder that supports the build plate so that you can have a nice smooth removal or separation of the model from the build plate. And we had the model processing before the surgical guide. So by the time this was fabricated, it was, I think, less than two hours and we're ready to go. We just have to remove those supports and go from there. Here's what this looks like. I think it looks really beautiful, right? It's a beautiful art piece. And here, how it approximates to our model. So the model was on a fast print, and that's how accurate the actual surgical guide is. So to the right and left of this prime print surgical guide is what our milled units used to look like. Not horrible, but definitely about five, well, I think it was maybe 10 times more expensive. So we're saving money by doing this, and we can be more efficient because we can do more than just one implant. So lots of design services out on the web where you can have these, these um, surgical guides developed and then imported in and you can just print them out. That's great stuff. So let's take a minute to talk about something that I love, which are splints. We do a lot of jaw joint patients in our office, people who have modified jaw joints. And if you have ever known someone who has come in in a great deal of pain, you don't wanna to have to wait two weeks for the lab to fabricate your splints. So these have been extremely helpful, the fact that we can have this overnight. So what I like to do is number one, uh, you know, get a feel for what is the condition of the jaw joint before I put the leaf gauge in. Um, for those patients that I can use a leaf gauge in, this is, I'm going to identify my first point of contact in a fully seated condylar position or CR. Once I have that spot, I'm gonna go ahead and increase the uh, thickness of the leaf gauge by two millimeters. So I can be sure that in that first point of contact, I will at least have two millimeters thick material. And then I'll go ahead and do my scan with the leaf gauge in place. So here we'll set this up for a splint. Here is my bite now. Again, I've already predetermined the uh, separation between the upper and lower jaw. If you did, if you had models that you did not separate, there is a feature that allows you to open the teeth, but it's not as accurate as actually doing the bite record with a jig or a leaf gauge. So here we have our models. Now I'm ready to go into my design app. So easy peasy, we've got everything down at the bottom. I can just go through each one of these little categories to make sure I've got everything in the position that I want to have it. So prepare the model. I wanna make sure that I clean up the model. It just makes it, uh, it, makes it easier for accuracy of your uh, articulation. I'm gonna define the insertion axis. What's the insertion axis? It's the way the patient puts the splint in. So I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I'll bring it a little more anterior and, um, and see what that would do because I think the patient will probably put it in more at this trajectory than the other trajectory. It's a variable. Now I'm gonna look at my block out. We know what block out is. Let's see how that looks. That will just be you know, some of the gapping that you'll have between structures um, and the uh, splint itself. So all those areas in blue are the areas that are gonna have some block out. That looks fine to me. So now I'm gonna go into the design phase. I have a couple of ways that I can actually create the splint. I can draw the line myself or I can create by plane. I'm gonna create by plane. This is how I kind of always start things out. I'm gonna raise this up so that it's on the teeth to a level that I kind of like, and then I can tilt it around with that little disc and just get a general idea, a general positioning overall for where I want to have that splint designed. 
once I'm done with that, I can actually go in and <clears throat> and edit the line to be more uh, precise where I want to actually have my line. So I'm going to apply this. And then it's going to give me my line. Now, if I want to, I can edit this line. And that's what I'll do. I'll edit it to exactly where I want to have it positioned on the teeth. So with a couple of clicks, we're going to outline the teeth and how we want to have that flange designed. I usually like it to go below the free gingival margins on the lingual. I feel like that's a little smoother transition for the tongue. Otherwise, the tongue is like constantly flicking if it's too easily available. And then we'll make some final adjustments here. So again, you know, the software is really easy to use. You know, it doesn't, uh, there's not language that's written there. I have used other software programs where I wasn't exactly sure what they were talking about. And that kind of compromised, you know, the outcome of my appliance. And, you know, just keep it simple. I mean, there is that expression, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, that's totally me. I want it simple and easy to use. I don't want anything too complicated. You know, I'm already working the back end of this case, knowing exactly what I'm dealing with, with the jaw joint. That's where I want to put my intellectual <laughs> uh, brain power instead of trying to figure out how to use a software system. So now I've got the line pretty much where I want to have it. Okay, maybe not. I think this does it here. And now I'm going to apply and look at the appliance that it gives me. I think that's looking pretty good. That's the way I like to see things. So here's our projected splint, and that's based upon the thickness that I programmed into the bite. I'm gonna take a look at my contacts, and those little varying degrees of color indicate your bite pressure, so I can go ahead and smooth, remove, add if I want to. So I'll go through, make my finishing touches here. You might notice under this tools here, you know, you have the option to open the jaw and make it thicker. There's articulator grinding. I don't really like using this because it tends to make super deep facets of that opposing uh, arch that comes in the contact with the appliance. And then you've got another person who's locked in and that's not what I wanna have here. So I'm happy with the way that uh, that relationship is here. So now I'm going to finish up my appliance by putting, oh, okay, hold on a minute. I'm gonna add a little bit to these little areas here and smooth these out. Of course, I could do that with a hand piece as well. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna put my, my label on here for who this belongs to as well as date. And we're ready to, to print it. So once I've got that all done, I'm gonna export that into my in-lab cam. Here's what that looks like. The supports, I'd rather have them on the outside than on the inside. So this was a splint that uh, you can actually see how that articulator grinding made that surface really rough. But we're gonna smooth that out anyway. Here's what the, um, the printed um, uncured version of the splints look like. And here's what the um, cured version of the splints look like. Very nice. So a little bit of lab work to remove the, um, the struts the, or the, the supports. 
They're very, very tiny where they touch the appliance, which makes it very easy to smooth them out. Sometimes they can be really thick. And, um, and then, you know, you're really working forever to get that nice and smooth. So let's take a, minute, a moment to talk about temporaries. The advantage to printing temporaries versus milling temporaries is you don't have to worry about over milling, right? So on implants, this is where I really like to use these. Let's go ahead and mute that. Oops, sorry guys, hold on a minute. There. So here we had uh, implant bridge and we just want the tissues to get trained a little bit, give them an opportunity to integrate a little bit more, the implants that is. And so we made these uh, beautiful temporaries. Again, on top of the printer here, you can actually see the cartridge in the material unit. Now, the nice thing is, as you see, there's a green light on top and on the prime print unit that actually tells you that it's done printing. So you don't have to look at the display and figure out how many more minutes. You can do that if you would like, but uh, very easy for the team to just look over at the units and see if there's a red light, then you know that there's some kind of interruption with the printing process. You know, when the uh, printer is in the middle, that little light that you see in front will be halfway done, halfway green. So, you know, the team is able to quickly look at the units and they know exactly where time is standing. Is it done yet? You don't need to walk over and look into the tiny screen. You can just glance and then you have a good idea of, um, of what's going on. So now we've transferred this temporary um, into our post-processing unit and the the display says, no, no, you don't have the right alcohol in there. So everything is coded with an RFID and the computer system immediately reads it. So it knows that this is coming with the uh, temporary material in it. And therefore we need to change the washing units. So we change the uh, the washing units to be compatible with the resin that we have printed out the temporary material in. And this way we know there's no cross contamination of different resin materials getting washed with this resin. So I like that idea. I don't wanna put something in a patient's mouth that might have model resin you know, attached to it. The same way I don't like to polish my um, uncentered zirconia with my Emacs um, wheels, you know, it's the same premise. I want everything separated. Emacs stays with Emacs and Zirconia is going to stay with Zirconia. So that's ready to go. Here's how the print turned out. So look how smooth that surface is. It's amazing. I think it's amazing. And uh, this is, this is good stuff. So now it's not going to take long for us to actually process this. We can check the fit of the implants. It doesn't get any more accurate than that. Have it on the models. This is actually custom abutments that were made from Atlantis. Our assistant always has a good time tailoring up and doing her artwork, making them look more lifelike. For uh, these resin units, we're gonna use OptiGlaze. Here's what her work looks like. It's beautiful, goes in the patient's mouth patient is super happy. So you can see the old one down below and now the new one matches her upper centrals perfectly. So one of the things we've been waiting for for a really long time is the ability to do diagnostic wax ups. So being a digital dentist and being a digital dentist for almost 20 years, we kind of have always, you know, you have to think outside of the box. And when you're thinking outside of the box, you're basically thinking about workarounds. How can I get around this and make it work the way that I want it to work? So that's what I'm gonna demonstrate here in this particular workflow. So this is a, a patient, I'm sure we all, all of us have patients like this. They've got a tremendous amount of wear. You've been talking to them about it. You're using photos, you're showing them the damage. They're still not getting it. They're still not moving forward with securing these teeth and putting them in into a healthier position. 
So this guy came in and he actually had to have, I think it was number 19. I think there's a hole there on that gold crown. And, uh, and so he had to have that tooth replaced. So instead of doing that in one visit, I just conveniently mentioned that I'm gonna do it in two visits. The reason for, yes, I had an anterior motive. I had talked to this patient. We did an occlusal analysis on him. I've been really trying to explain to him what my concerns are. The good news is, is that he went and he had uh, a, a sleep test done. He's now using a CPAP, he feels better. And I think we're in a good place to move forward with something to secure this tooth structure. But I can't convince him of it. So I'm gonna do a full mouth scan to do this single unit crown. But when he comes back, before I deliver that crown, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do a mock-up for him. And I've imported his scans into my in-lab CAD and I'm going to tell my in-lab CAD that we're going to be doing some crowns. So I'm going to go ahead and fill out this information for my patient. We're going to print out some, you know, temporary crowns with the prime print. So I'm going to import my STLs. And again, that's in a central location on my server. Going to go ahead work through go ahead and work through my workflow identifying my model access setting the jaw line and all that means is that i'm identifying the teeth that are, are um that all the numbers are on the teeth correctly that i have the outline of the jaw all set up and then well what does the computer want to know it wants to know where the uncut tooth structure meets the um the change to structure okay or the cut to structure in this case it's gonna be the changed to structure. So I'm gonna make that demarcation right along the wear and functional areas. I'm gonna to try to fool the computer. I'm gonna do my parameters so that there's not really material thickness. I bring it all the way down to about 100. It can actually go less than that. And I'm gonna make sure that I apply that to all, all of these restorations. And now to get my proposal, I'll go into edit element. And this is what it gives me. That's not so bad. That's not so bad looking. You know, if I wanted to, to uh, have this patient do a diagnostic wax up, I would have to have him cover my lab expenses. You know, so if we're doing, you know, basically we're looking at doing 14 units here, it would be $1,400 just for him to see where he can go to get the engineering part done. If I'm having a hard time getting this guy to move forward with treatment and see the benefit of treatment, this is a really easy way. I mean, this just takes my time to do this. But very inexpensively, I can present this to the patient without him having any financial obligation or even obligation to move forward with treatment. But I'm gonna give him a little peek into the future of what he can do. And that's my goal. So here I've got my wax ups completed. Now, remember the computer thinks these are gonna be porcelain crowns. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into my administration phase because I've got things designed now. And up here at that little icon, I'm gonna go ahead and insert these. And this is going to give me a wax model. This is going to give me a model. I'm gonna export that into my uh, in-lab cam. Go to model. Here's what that model is gonna look like. It looks pretty good, right? This isn't costing me a ton of money. And really, I'm just doing this for looks. I'm not working out all the functional, functional details of this case yet. Okay, so now I'm going to print this model. There's the printed model. You can see that the uh, areas that I added, yes, they're bulky, but that's okay. I'm just gonna go ahead and make a little splint or stint, and I'm gonna transfer this with some Luxitemp into his mouth. And now I'm gonna give him the ability to see where we can go. Okay, I get it, the notch on number nine, not so great, but you know, this is to just give him an idea of where or how much to structure, it doesn't matter how you look at it, where he can go, how much he's lost. And for this gentleman, it was a really emotional moment for him. And he just hadn't realized how much to structure how much his tooth structure had changed through the years. And 
he felt so incredibly younger with this, just this little lux temp in his mouth. It was really moving for him. He has moved forward with treatment. It took me a while to get him to understand that this has nothing to do with aesthetics, but it has to do with reinforcing really damaged teeth and how we can get that done for him. So it opened up a door for us to have this conversation again, and it gave him a visual aid. Visual aids work for me. Visual aids were tremendous for this patient. So really made me happy. Just gonna touch on dentures. Are you gonna take a video? No, I just wanna have a little video. <laughs> yeah, not, 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 All right, no. hold on a minute. Let me get this <laughs> muted here. Okay. So here is a course that we did with AA Dental where we're actually printing two separate pieces. You're printing the teeth and you're printing the pink base, right? One's white, one's pink. And then you are actually going to fuse these together. And that's what we are practicing in this course. So this was really effective. This is the future. And when you think about the scope of care you'll be able to provide with patients by printing, it is so incredibly exciting. And I love the fact that, you know, we may be able to service a population that maybe hasn't been able to be serviced because we've had, you know, dentistry is expensive, you know, but if we're doing things like this, it might make it, you know, more affordable to do more, uh, philanthropic, uh, you know, more um, uh, cases for people that, you know, don't have, um, don't have money, right? I can't remember the word, guys, sorry. Brain isn't working. So really exciting stuff. And there's a lot of uh, uh, clinicians out there right now who are teaching these uh, techniques and how to make the denture really appear very lifelike. It's exciting things and um, really fun. So if you're, if you're doing a lot of dentures, I would highly recommend that you look into some of those courses. That one was from AA Dental Design here in uh, Temecula with Frankie Acosta. But I know there are a lot of other uh, guys out there that are doing these kind of procedures like Wally Renna. All right, so um, last thing that I wanna mention is DS Core. So DS Core is kind of a way for us to store things into the cloud any Densify Serona um, apparatus, a piece of equipment that you have, you're able to store all of your scans, store all of your CBCTs. Um, you can send this out to people, lab technicians, for instance, send out the scans, they can receive it, they can design, they can send you back the STL, and then you can go ahead and print these things out. It's really um, a wonderful thing, a wonderful service, and everything is cloud-based, and this is actually supported with Google. So um, a lot of people have questions uh, regarding first thing that I thought of is uh, whoa, um, security, you know, privacy. And, um, and they've done a really outstanding job collaborating with Google and um, making sure that everything is where it needs to be in terms of security. So really exciting stuff. This will also um, apply to the um, Dent Supply Serona being able to determine if there's any issues with any of the equipment that you have or if equipment needs maintenance or software updates or maybe a motor is failing in your milling unit. So this is something we're really excited to be part of and to have the support from Dent Supply Serona. So I'd highly recommend uh, looking into that. So I have to say, um, you know, I'm an advocate for Dent Supply Serona because I've worked with them for so long and I love their products. And the Prime Print is, you know, no exception. It's an amazing addition to our office. And as I mentioned, it was something that I was reluctant to, but it's alleviated all of the printing to our team. Our team has fun with it. We can delegate, it's easy, it's safe. Uh, we're faster, we're able to uh, provide splints for patients uh, more quickly. And um, yeah, I have more free time, more freedom as a clinician. So it's not just because I'm delegating things out to, to my team that I have more freedom, but I always think of like all of these, you know, milling units, CBCT, printing, you know, what does this do for me as a clinician? it brings me closer to being off the grid. What does that mean? It means that I don't have to be dependent on a lab. I don't have to wait for a lab to do a diagnostic, you know, wax up for me that's gonna take two months, right? 
ever since COVID, I'm waiting, you know, one to two months to get diagnostic wax ups. And I don't want to do that. You know, I love having the ability, uh, the education and the knowledge to design crowns myself, understanding the materials, what those materials can do for me in terms of aesthetics or strength. It just depends on what's indicated. So I'm getting one step closer to being off the grid by incorporating printed in, printing into my workflow. I'm also going to have more restorative options for patients. Um, there's some really fantastic things coming out with some of the printed materials that, uh, that we can use right now. And it is the future of dentistry, you know, um, it's a scary thing taking on all of these, uh, these workflows, you know, and how do you manage all of the equipment, the IT part, and, um, and all of those things, you have to take those things into consideration. But I will tell you that de digital dentistry is here and it's not going to go away. And it is, um, it, the printing is the future of dentistry. I really see that we'll be printing crowns and bridges and removable prostheses where we're already printing. So um, the, uh, you know, the younger clinicians that are out there tonight, I think that this is a, a great way to brand yourself. And, um, and patients are enthusiastic about anything that makes it easier for them when they come to the dentist for your care. So I would highly encourage you to <clears throat> really seek that out. All right, so at this point, I am going to open it up for any questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. You're welcome. As mentioned, we're gonna open up the floor for any questions anyone may have. So if you have a question, please type it in the box labeled, to have a question to your right. Yeah, so I see one question over here regarding the, um, the splints that I am producing versus the splints that are produced in the lab. And I have to say that um, in a, in a dentition that, yeah, I have to say that, you know, whether I get it lab fabricated or whether I'm fabricating, I feel like there's still the same amount of adjustments. The only difference between my lab fabricated splints and the splints that I'm actually making. So for those of you who uh, didn't read the question, there was a question about, do you find a significant difference between seeding a lab produced occlusal splint versus one printed with a prime print with respect to adjustments? And I would say, no, I do not. The only thing that I've noticed is that my lab fabricated splints have ball class, which, you know, aid with retention. And that's really the only difference. And half the time I inactivate the ball splints anyway. So that's the only dis difference that I have found. Um, another question came forward. Do we have an ETA for additional resins from DS? Yeah, they're working on that all the time. Um, I have to say that right now, what I have is working for me but you don't know what you don't know. So I'm looking forward to whatever they develop for the future. Um, we just had a meeting a little while ago and, and they're doing some great things. The, um, the uh, research and development, they're always working with materials and we're like, yeah, we want more printing. We want more printing. So, um, so they're gonna get hot on that if they're not already. I'm sure they have a huge uh, department for that. Um, how far away do you think a restorative crown material is? Nothing is permanent. Um, I've actually placed some of these resin hybrid uh, veneers. And um, yeah, I think they're cool. And they're really pretty, really pretty material. So I think that it is very near. And is compri um, prime print compatible with other scanners, for example, Itero? So the way that you would manage the prime print working with another scanner is you would be exporting STLs and importing them into your in-lab software. So uh, while I do not work with Itero, I do believe based on that, you should be able to import those SDLs into the, um, the InLab software and, and work with that. And as long as you have the InLab 22, you can use the prime print. Okay, let's see if I see any of this. 
I have not. The question came about, have you made any custom trays with the prime print? I have not. I don't do a lot of removable and um, I therefore don't really, um, haven't had the need to actually do a custom tray yet. So I'm sorry, Joshua, I do not have any feedback about that. And best place to get training on the software. So CDOCS is always a great resource for any Dense Slice Verona product. They have just numerous classes and uh, extremely knowledgeable um, team there. And that's one of my main resources that, that I like to go to for, um, for training. And let's see if there's anything else. I think that covers it. Any Great, other yeah. Oh, sorry, what was that? Go on. Oh, I just was asking any other questions before we wrap it up? Yeah, if anyone else has any additional questions, feel free to type them in the box. We can give it a couple more minutes. And then if not, if there's anything we didn't get to, we can definitely get those answered for everyone. Yeah, actually, I have um, a, an email here. Is that the best email to use, Blake? Webinars at HenryShine.com. Yep. You guys would Perfect. you know, forward that to me if there's any questions that I yep. haven't answered. Please um, let us know. And thank you all so much. Absolutely. And thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We did record tonight's webinar and we'll email out the recording sometime in the next week. And we would appreciate everyone's feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. So thank you again so much for tonight and thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you very much for having me.